We have begun our disciple, our uh, generosity season by following Jesus through discipleship school. Uh, Mark chapter 8, 20 through chapter 10, 50. Your assignment is to read that every week as we go through this series uh, to learn the story. I began with a couple of assumptions. The first assumption in this series is that we do not know as much as we think we know. We do not know as much as we think we know. As the Apostle Paul says, I see dimly now. But also, I have this assumption. We are capable of so much more than we ever could imagine. We are capable of more than we can imagine. You will do even greater things than these, said Jesus. And these two assumptions can be true at the same time. We cannot know as much as we think we know. We can also be more than we ever thought we would ever be. So last week we focused on Jesus, the healing of a blind man. Jesus touched a man who was blind. He could see a little bit. He couldn't quite see clearly. And so Jesus touched him for a second time before he could see clearly. Now this wasn't because of any failure in Jesus' part. I think Mark is teaching us a deeper lesson here. He is pointing to the human condition, original sin. I like to talk about it in terms of our ego. It's hard to see God working in our world because I get in the way. I want to center myself in the world, and it's hard to set my ego aside so that I can see what God is all about in Christ. I need my eyes touched, and it's going to take more than one time. We're not going to get it fully, especially the first time. We'll partially get it. Our eyes will need to be touched again and again, over and over. So God is always present with us, but the reality is that we're not always present to God. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, the presence of God is with you. But the question is, are we... Are we awakened to the presence of God? So this discipleship school is about living fully into the presence of God. It's about the journey of discovering that Jesus is the Messiah. So we don't know as much as we think, but we are going to be more than we ever imagined because of God's grace. Presence. Presence. When we think of presence, we, we often think of last week's lesson about prayer, communion with God and God being with us. But this week, the heart of our life in community is that we commit to be present to one another. We commit to be present to one another and to any we come in contact with. That's the focus of today. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing unto you, O Lord our God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So when you join a United Methodist Church, you're asked this question. Will you faithfully participate in the ministries of this church through your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? As I was reading that in the first sermon today, first series, the first worship service today, I realized it's kind of redundant. Will you faithfully participate? Will you participate? That's the same as presence, is it not? God is always present with us. Jesus said the greatest command was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. You can do that anytime, anywhere. God is always present to us. But then Jesus is not satisfied with just one greatest commandment that they'd asked him for. He gives a second. And he says the second is like the first. And the most important words are, is like. The second is like the first. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. In our presence with one another, our love for one another is the same as loving God. When we love another human thing... It is the same as loving God. Jesus has called 12 disciples to follow, to be in intimate 
community. Jesus' life points to the love and grace of God. His life reveals the way of being in the world that is faithful to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is among you, Jesus said. And of course, remember, Jesus is southern. He says, the kingdom of God is among y'all. Right? The kingdom of God is among you all. Now, there are great crowds that follow Jesus. Great crowds. He feeds 5,000 one day, feeds 4,000 another day with a few loaves and a couple of fish. Crowds of people are following him, but Jesus takes these 12 to journey with him. He teaches these 12 to be deep in faith, to reflect on their experience with Christ, to learn from him, to follow, to be fully present to Jesus, to be fully present to one another. Now, our scripture today is the smack dab middle of Mark's gospel. It takes all the way to the middle of Mark's gospel before someone can confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the, the anointed one of God. We're told that he's this in chapter 1, verse 1. But it takes 8 chapters and 19 verses before anyone will make this confession. And if you just kind of go through the headlines of the gospel of Mark, you're going to see that the disciples had an amazing amount of experience with Jesus. Some of them taught him, saw him teach with authority and move, remove an unclean spirit. They, Simon Peter saw him heal his mother-in-law. They saw people respond to his teaching and his preaching. He touches a man with leprosy, making himself unclean, but making the man clean. He heals a man that is paralyzed, and he forgives his sin. He invites outcasts to be a part of his inner community, even the hated tax collector. He challenges those in power that abuse their power, that use their power for personal gain rather than for the blessing of the community. He challenges the temple the way they practice the purity code, the debt code, the Sabbath law. He heals a man on the Sabbath because the Sabbath was made for humans, not humans for the Sabbath. Jesus redefines family. We so often want to limit family as to blood relatives. But Jesus teaches that anyone who seeks to do the will of my Father in heaven is my mother and my brother and my sister. He teaches about the kingdom of God and this vision of God's kingdom that he presents is so terrifying that he is rejected time and time again. And the disciples saw him rejected. But they also saw him calm a storm. Jesus healed a woman that had a flow of blood for 12 years. And in the midst of that, he healed a girl who was 12 years old. He sent the disciples out two by two. The disciples had the chance to go out in the name of Jesus and proclaim the kingdom of God and do the very same work that Christ had done. And as I said earlier, he saw 5,000 fed, then 4,000 fed. He had walked on water. He had healed a foreign woman. He had cured a deaf man. All of this before the chapter 8, 20 following. The disciples had spent time in community together with Jesus, with one another. They were present to Jesus. They were present to one another they showed up day after day after day. What did Melinda say was showing up? What did Melinda say was presence? Well, it's showing up. Are we able to see beyond the physical miracles that Jesus performed and see the deeper spiritual relational healing that he is inviting us to, quote, see? Whenever we see miracles, whether they're healing miracles or miracles of nature, Mark is always inviting us to go deeper, to see beyond the physical, to see what Christ is doing in our world and in our lives and in our hearts. He's inviting us to see the transformation that can take place for us. The healing, the miracles are inviting us to go deep 
with Christ. So Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? It's important to remember that this question that Jesus is asking isn't asked in a vacuum. He hasn't walked up to a stranger on the street and said, who do you say that I am? He hasn't knocked on a door and just made a cold call and said, who do you say that I am? Jesus is asking those that have walked with him day by day, moment by moment, over a long period of time. When we make the vow as members of the Methodist Church, I will participate in its ministries by my presence, we are being invited to go deep. To go deep in our faith. To go deep in our lives. Jesus didn't say, come and follow me and uh, follow as long as you're having fun. No, he says, follow me. And when you follow Jesus over a long period of time, you have the chance to follow Jesus when everything is great. You can have the opportunity to follow Jesus when everything is turned completely upside down and the wind blows and the waters rise and your world is completely torn apart. Following Jesus over a long period of time, we discover more deeply what it means for him to be the Messiah. We discover what it means for us more deeply to understand what it means to be a disciple. To follow consistently, to live in community, present with one another, to participate in life is to discover what it means for Jesus to be the Messiah beyond an intellectual agreement. We are being invited to be immersed into the presence of the Holy Spirit, to be immersed in the presence of the resurrected Christ. The disciples have followed Jesus over a long period of time and they saw that Jesus was the real deal. They discerned by their experience of following him in community that Jesus was from God in some form or fashion. What's everybody saying about me? What's the word on the street? Well, you're, you're another John the Baptist. You're another Elijah, the first great prophet of Israel. Or one of the other prophets. You are truly a person of God. You are worth leaving everything to follow. And in that experience, the disciples journey with Jesus. But then the question comes, who do you say that I am? And that's the question that each one of us must answer ourselves. There's no such thing as a second-generation Christian. I'm not Christian because my daddy made a profession of faith a long time ago. We are invited to experience this truth, to immerse ourselves in this reality ourselves. And Peter, speaking for the disciples, may be expressing their hope. You're the Messiah. You are the anointed one of God. You are the one that we've been looking for. And Peter is able to make this confession. And we didn't know that we know from verse 1, chapter 1, that this is a correct profession. He's able to confess. You are the Christ, and he can do this because he has followed Jesus over a long period of time in community. He had joined 11 others to learn from Jesus, to experience Jesus, to have their eyes open to see his presence. If someone ever wants to know what it means to be a Christian, our proper answer is, come, let's follow Jesus together. Let's follow Jesus together. Mark's gospel teaches that salvation is following Jesus as Lord. Salvation is following Jesus as Lord. 
And we do this in community. We do it together. We only, quote, get it, or we only see as we follow. We learn to see by getting it wrong. We don't know as much as we think we know. We get it wrong. We're going to continue to get it wrong. But in spite of getting it wrong, we continue to follow. We continue to follow anyway. Now, I don't like to be wrong, and I especially don't like to be called out in being wrong. But over the next few chapters, we're going to see that Jesus calls out the disciples for not quite seeing clearly. But what do they do? Do they tuck their tail and run? No. They continue to follow. Mark is inviting us to go deep as followers of Christ. And you know what? It's okay to not get it. It's okay to not see clearly. In fact, that's the expectation. We only see dimly now. That's the Apostle Paul speaking. Paul didn't say, I can see clearly now. No, I can only see dimly. That's the norm. So salvation, following Jesus, doesn't magically happen in one instant. Woo, we're perfect. God's grace, God's sanctifying grace is working day by day, moment by moment, so that we can be shaped and formed and transformed, so that we can mature and grow and experience salvation. David Buttrick, a preaching professor, uh, from Vanderbilt, I had a chance to hear one time, and someone raised their hand and said, uh, Dr. Buttrick, when were you saved? And Dr. Buttrick says, well, I prefer to say that I'm a part of a being saved community. I'm a part of a being saved community. Man, there's a lot in that, isn't it? Salvation isn't just a personal thing. Am I saved if you're not saved? Am I really saved if you're struggling and you're hurting and you're suffering and you feel lost? I'm a part of a being saved community. I'm not there yet. My eyes don't see fully clearly yet. Salvation is a continuing lifelong process. And folks, that's absolutely good news. Do we expect a 25-year-old to have the wisdom of a 45-year-old or of a 65-year-old? We do not. We hope and pray that this 25-year-old is attentive to their life experiences, that they're open and willing to learn and to grow. Do you know why we have in our Constitution in America that you have to be 35 in order to run for president? Because we don't want a 25-year-old to run for president. They don't have enough wisdom yet. The disciples in Mark's gospel do not get it completely, fully. But they are present. They show up. We shouldn't look at them and their failure as an oddity, their failure to see clearly as an oddity. They are the norm. As you read these chapters this week, they are us and we are them. Mark reveals the truth of what it means for us to be the disciples. We get it? No, we don't get it. We get it? We don't get it. That's grace. That's grace at work. If I could get it, I wouldn't need grace. If I got everything right, why do we need Jesus? It is revealed that we don't get it. Take a deep breath. God's working. God's grace is at work. So our commitment to be present to the ministries of North Raleigh is a, is a commitment to be present to one another. It is the gift of community. And I call it a gift 
because it truly is a gift. I will not grow. I will not mature. I will not be what God has created me to be without you. But folks, community is hard. It is absolutely hard, hard work. It's hard because all the people... If it was just me, I'd be fine. Thank you very much. But I can't be community by myself. So we get it wrong, and those around us get it wrong, but we continue to seek to love each other and to receive the love from others. We don't fully understand, and we act like we understand, but we don't fully understand. But we offer grace, and we open ourselves to receive grace. Man, I want to dig my heels in because I don't want to change. I'm happy just like I am. And we refuse to step into the new. We refuse to enter into the kingdom of God. But Jesus simply offers more grace. And you come along and say, hey, let's talk about this. Let's work through this. Let's journey together. And my heel gets out of the sand and in the dirt and I discover I can take the next step. Peter and the uh, disciples, their eyes, they're beginning to see. They see a little more clearly, a little more truthfully. And we're going to discover next week they don't see very clearly at all. But that's okay. Because today we recognize in following Jesus that he is the Messiah. He's the one we've been looking for. He is the real deal. So as United Methodists, we commit to practices that transform. Our membership vows are practices that we all commit to. Prayers, presence, being present to one another, gifts, service, and witness. We seek to go deep. And going deep sometimes is very painful. But we're willing to do this because we recognize that Jesus is the real deal. That salvation comes in following Jesus as Lord. And salvation comes as we commit to follow Jesus together in community. By staying close to Jesus, through prayers we talked about last week, by staying close to one another in presence, God's grace will do what God's grace will do. And we'll do more than we ever imagined. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our stewardship